For a man's labor also is a commodity exchangeable for benefit as well as any other thing. Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan. Hi there, welcome back. Sancho's egocentric response to this line of thinking is complex. First, he says that he is too poor to be envied. Then he defends his personal honor by insisting on his orthodoxy and his ethnic purity. Note how he expresses a certain moral contradiction. I've always believed firmly and truly in God and in everything that is maintained and believed by the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And then there's my being a mortal enemy, as I am, of the Jews. And so the historians should take pity on me and treat me well in their writings. Sancho asks for pity from the mysterious authors of his story while simultaneously bragging that he has none for Jews. Finally, Sancho affirms that no matter what anyone else says, he is always fair with everyone. I was born naked and I'm naked now. I neither lose nor gain a thing. This will be Sancho's mantra in part two. Cervantes is preparing us for a serious examination of Sancho's character. Did you know? All practicing Jews were expelled from Spain by the Catholic king via the Alhambra Decree of 1492. Those who chose to remain were obligated to convert to Catholicism. Thus the term converso used to refer to new Christians of Jewish descent. Sancho ends this already contradictory speech with a kind of paradox. He will accept infamy if it grants him fame. Although, seeing myself now rendered in books and passed about in the world from hand to hand, I don't care one fig. They can say anything they want to about me. At this, Don Quixote launches into a labyrinthical speech of his own, focusing on famous examples of Sancho's odd logic. Here he is pushing the limits of a common rhetorical exercise practiced by humanist scholars of the Renaissance. He mentions that certain women at court were offended at being left out of a vicious satire written about them. He recalls Aristratus, who set fire to the temple of Diana just so he could be famous. He mentions other figures who were daringly destructive, such as Caesar when he crossed the Rubicon, or Hernán Cortés, that most courteous Cortés, when he burnt his ships at Veracruz. This is confusing and quite funny. Don Quixote slips casually from clear examples of idiots to examples of men that many consider to be heroes. Even more confusing, other exemplars mentioned by Don Quixote do not at all fit the paradoxical notion of doing something wrong for the sake of fame. Rather, they express the opposite, simple, heroic self-sacrifice. We have Horatius Cocles, who defended the oldest bridge of ancient Rome against invaders. Gaius Mucius Scaevola, who put his hand in a fire when threatened with torture. And most important of all, given Don Quixote's own profession, Marcus Curtius, a classical knight who threw himself and his horse into a deep burning abyss, Profunda Cima Ardiente, which had threatened to destroy Rome after an earthquake in 362 BC. What paradox does Sancho express when he contemplates the intentions of the author of the first part of the novel? A. He will accept bread so long as there is work. B. He will accept a bad reputation if it results in fame. C. He will accept conversion if he can remain a Jew. Correct answer, B. He will accept a bad reputation if it results in fame. However, the most fascinating example involves Charles V, who fashioned himself as a modern Caesar. The Holy Roman Emperor made a triumphant visit to Rome in 1536 after conquering Tunis the year before. He wanted to visit the Roman Pantheon, known in the 16th century as Santa Maria della Rotonda. This incredibly famous architectural wonder contains a round skylight which is at its peak, that is, at the zenith, thema of its dome which is perfectly spherical, or as Don Quixote says, shaped like half an orange. According to Don Quixote, the emperor took a tour of this building and was standing on the dome above this skylight looking down, after which his guide, a Roman gentleman, made a shocking confession. 
a thousand times your sacred majesty, I have felt the urge to embrace your majesty and then hurl myself down from that skylight in order that my fame should leave its eternal mark on the world. The emperor thanked him and ordered him to keep his distance. But Don Quixote ultimately rejects the desire for fame and his words emphasize the importance of not transgressing the limits of Christian morality. Thus, O oh Sancho, our actions should not transcend the limits placed upon us by the Christian religion that we profess. A lesson for an anti-Semitic old Christian squire. That's all for now. We'll see each other in our next video. Don't miss out on the adventures of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote de la Mancha. To enroll in the course, click on the novel. To subscribe to our YouTube channel, click on Don Quixote. To watch more videos, click on Dulcinea. And to follow us on our social media, click on Sancho Panza.